Hello, insane children and people of YouTube. This is American McGee, and we are starting up yet another crowd design session. This is crowd design session number 14. And of course, we are working on concepts, design, story, and art for Alice Asylum. Um, I think we have a few of our mods in the chat if anybody wants to say hello. Hi. I guess I could say hello. Hello. Yes, big, big hellos. If this is your first time to join one of these crowd design sessions or you're following along over on YouTube, there are links in the description below that will take you to our Patreon, which is how you gain access to our Discord server. It is via Discord that you can participate in these design sessions live, as many of our insane children are doing today. And a big hello to all of our insane children who are in the chat. The format for today's crowd design session is going to be as follows. We are first going to have a look at the horror house or house of horrors. This is a centerpiece to the circus realm, and that is a function of Alice's denial. It is one of the first places that Alice will visit in Asylum, and sitting at the, at the center of that realm is this house of horrors. Um, it is representative of the exit, how she leaves denial and moves on to the next stage of her journey. Uh, the House of Horrors is going to be shrouded in some sort of, it had previously suggested fog, um, but it has now come up that we might actually wrap it in a series of large scale posters, as you might see at a circus. Um, so what I wanted to do to start with is that we have a look at the exterior of the House of Horrors, and we do a little bit of crowd design brainstorming on what it is that we might represent, what we might show on those posters. So just to kind of get you thinking, um, you could imagine that one of the posters, billboards, might be the master of illusions, and it could be, you know, the great martini okay. uh, magician who is somewhere on the fairgrounds. The idea being that the posters would have subtle or maybe not so subtle reference to the, the concept of denial, of illusion. So um, yeah, I thought it'd be kind of fun actually if our insane children wanted to take a stab at the content of those posters. As you can see by the concept image that's on screen, there are a number of panels. Um, there's probably gonna be you know 20 plus panels. Now the way they're painted up right now is as if to show the House of Horrors is uh, kind of a nice, cute place, and then those posters would come down. I was thinking maybe those posters um, shouldn't just misrepresent what's inside, but they could be kind of advertisements for things that you'd find in the fairgrounds, the Circus of Denial. Um, so anyway, we could kick off with that, if anybody has any suggestions for the contents of those posters. Uh, after that, we're going to have a look at the realm of denial. Again, the denial concepts, um, story, art are all over on the wiki. Again, links to those are in the description below. The page for denial has actually become quite well populated now. Thank you very much to our mod. Uh, I don't, Taylor, are you going by a different name these days? Should we, I refer you to you can, in Arcadia? <laughs> you can still call me Taylor. Okay, so Taylor. Um, AKA Arcadia uh, did a lot of really great work on the wiki page for denial. So we'll have a quick look at that. And then we can jump to the suggestions page on the wiki. Uh, again, links to that are in the description below if you're following along on YouTube. So who has ideas for what might be contained on the circus posters? Again, things related to illusion, um, uh, related to avoidance, related to denial. Any thoughts or suggestions? I see someone's posted up, uh, Nabby Yang has posted up Captain Spaulding. Um, I don't know what that reference is, although he looks familiar. Where do, where do we know him from? Mm, doesn't look familiar to me. It's, uh, it's a mystery. Who is yeah. Captain Spaulding? It's pretty creepy. I like him, though. He is very creepy. Uh, someone dizzy in the chat suggests forgetfulness potions, ads for something like that. That's a really good one. Um, I could imagine that as a sort of Victorian elixir 
And of course, they had things like that, um, laudlum, and of course, people just straight up did all kinds of what we now know to be, you know, or now are illegal drugs. Um, but yeah, opium and heroin and cocaine and things like that were all sort of consumed in the open. And so having ads for things that would help you forget, that would be fantastic. Um, so I like that idea a lot, Dizzy. You can imagine our artists would have a really good time drawing up the posters for things like that. Uh, Savril says, yeah, that, that the uh, clown, Captain Spaulding, is from a Rob Zombie film. Exactly. Uh, the Devil's Reject. Rejects, says Navi. Or House think... of a Thousand Corpses. I don't think I've seen that one. Um, so the Octo Chicken says maybe something annoyingly blunt, but an advertisement for a riverboat trip on the majestic <laughs> River Nile. <laughs> That's actually a really good one. I like that a lot. Um, I don't know that 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 euphemism, that that joke would have been um, something in the Victorian era, but of course we'll all see it and laugh. So that's um, that's a good one. I like that a lot. <laughs> For those that don't get the joke, I mean, I'm sure everyone's heard it, but um, it's the old phrase that you know the Nile, the Nile isn't just a river in Egypt. Um, in other words, you are in denial. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> somebody, somebody had never heard that before, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's a good one. I like uh, I like the Nile trip posters. That's really cute. In fact, that would be kind of a fun thing to have as one of the rides in the park is a Nile river raft ride. And uh, yeah, so I think we'll go with that. Um, Jacob suggests that the posters could change their appearance as Alice faces them. The player would be able to see this since the game is in the third person. We could go from pleasant images to something darker when Alice turns away. Yeah, that's also a really good idea, Jacob. I think we'd mentioned this very, very early on. I'm talking like, you know, six months ago uh, when we had talked about denial. The One of the, the kind of primary functions or the features of it, I guess I should say, is, is just that, that um, it would be a realm where, looking at things head on, they'll have a they'll have the denial appearance. But if you kind of were to look at them side on, as you said in third person, we were able to do that. You'd see the mask come off. You'd see the darkness underneath the skin. So that's a good idea. Yeah, I kind of like that. It's. Uh, I wonder how we could use that mechanic to sort of not only show that Alice is not seeing something, but also to try and trick you, the player. Kind of reminds me a, a little bit of that Doctor Who enemy that you forget as soon as you're not looking at it. Ah, so it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, an interesting mechanic. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think we can try to take a look at just how far her, the sphere of influence of denial around her, I mean, that could also be a, port, a part of how she finally comes to realize that she's in denial is perhaps early on she's got this bubble of denial around her that's quite large and so we don't see the edges of it everything around us is within the the radius of that in that effect but then as the level progresses the the sphere around us shrinks and so that the, the camera starts to pop outside and we start to see the reality of the place where we are um, that could be quite interesting. Um, Connor Carbon points out that there is an on-rails element to um, to the horror house that reminds him of the mine car section of Silent Hill Downpour. Um, we'll have to take a look at that uh, another time, but that's a good thing to have as a reference. I can see from the image in the thumbnail there, it definitely looks very creepy. So in terms of other suggestions we have here, uh, it looks like the chat is quite busy with a couple of ideas. Um, but apparently, Greg took Magus's joke regarding denial. Yeah, I Oops. asked him if he's in Egypt and his feet are wet. Ah, yeah. <laughs> then he's in denial. Uh, any other thoughts that people have? I mean, I, I really like the the concept that Dizzy came up with for forgetfulness potions, because a lot of these would be advertisements um, for products. So, you know, you could imagine all the things that are for sale on the fairgrounds or perhaps the people who advertise at the fair. 
Um, and then of course, some of these ads could be for the acts, the, the shows, you know, so if you remember, you know, kind of from movies like Freaks, you, you have things like the incredible two-headed woman. Um, how might we turn those traditional circus posters into references for, you know, sort of having your head buried in the sand? Um, you know, there could literally be like a poster for a family that, you know, it's the ostrich family. They all live with their head in the sand, um, things like that. And of course, that is that could be a reference to not just what's happening to Alice right now, but it could be a reference to the fact that clearly her family must have been living in denial of the presence of malice, um, you know, in the form of Bumby prior to the fire, um, the prior fire. Maybe we could have a prior fire uh, poster as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that maybe some of those kind of references could be, uh, could be quite interesting. Uh, Morgan says an image of freaks that all have a part of her appearance or things that she recognizes from one of the posters. Yeah, that's a good idea. Sort of distorted versions of Alice herself on some of the posters. And, Maybe as um, family too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Seafoam says the ostrich man. So I like that. I think a big full scale poster or something like that, you know, the top of it shows a a, stand, a fully standing up, you know, head out of the ground ostrich man. Uh, and then the next frame, you know, on the same poster below, maybe it's him with his head stuck in the ground. Um, Jacob has an ad for a pair of magic glasses. Um, so he says, not sure if that was a thing until cereal boxes in the 1980s. I, I think that um, I get the, the concept there. You know, if you're in denial, um, maybe the idea would be a pair of rose tinted glasses. We'd have to see at what point in history rose tinted glasses, um, where the origin of that was. Um, but I think that the concept there was um, that if you see the world through those glasses, they got, they, they were, they've been in use since the 1840s. So there you go. We could have an ad for a pair of rose tinted glasses. Oh, yeah. That would work. Uh, it says here, it's not sure exactly when they began, the, the exact origin is in dispute, um, but that someone who looks through things through rose-tinted glasses looks on the bright side. Um, they have a glass half full or a silver lining view of things. Um, so yeah, we could have a pair of those being advertised. I think that's a good idea, Jacob. And uh, what are some of the other ones we've got here? One of the posters could change as you look away and have the Cheshire Cat appear to give advice. Um, I don't know if we've met the Cheshire Cat yet. That's a good question. So Rogue Booby, <laughs> I don't want to know about that. Remind everybody again, this is not Pornhub. Um, so Rogue Booby says that uh, one of the posters could change as you look away and have the Cheshire Cat appear to give advice. This is one of the things we're going to need to talk about, uh, which I put a pin in this for later, is does the Cheshire cat appear yet? I'm, in, I'm thinking, yeah. In Omri's notes, he said that the denial, the denial stage is the first place we're going to see the Cheshire cat. He's mm. all the way at the bottom of that page. Yeah. So the question is in what form and where? So we might want to, um, might want to make that solid. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I suppose even if we haven't seen him yet, we could have a uh, poster that features him on there as well. Um, what else have we got here? Magic glasses could be a mechanic that enable Alice to see the reality despite the current denial realm. Uh, that could be. Um, we, we have talked about having kind of alternate vision. So truth decay... Um, is suggesting that magic glasses would be fun. Perhaps that this advertisement we've discussed could actually end up becoming an item in the game. Um, we did that in the shrink mode last time around, and it was good because it created a sort of overloading. Not only were you able to go into smaller spaces, but you were also able to uh, reveal text on the wall you couldn't otherwise see. Uh, I've said before, I, I'd be a little bit hesitant to just have a pair of glasses that only serve that one function. I'd rather overload it to something else. Um, but I think we will need to find something that lets us see 
hidden text. Well, we talked about that uh, using the Chaos Necklace as a monocle, have we not? Yeah, that's right. So maybe that's something where this is not magic glasses that's being advertised, but it's the magic Chaos Monocle that's being advertised. Yeah. Okay. That's, um, that's a pretty good one. Um, yeah, Jacob says rose-tinted glasses as an idiom appeared in the late 1700s, okay? Well, that's certainly um, far enough back. And Greg points out that a type of glassware, tableware, um, that is always half full, uh, I think that's a good one as well. So Lucas says maybe there should be ads for things like the mangled mermaid, the rabbit animals, um, the trapeze act that always commit suicide while falling. Yeah, we could do that. Uh, having having posters that are just straight up, you know, related to places, locations, or acts on the fairgrounds is perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, Greg is confused that this isn't Pornhub. No, Greg, you clicked on the wrong tab um, in your browser. Sorry, you'll have to keep keep clicking. Okay, well, it looks like we got a fair number of good suggestions. Does anybody else have any other ideas, suggestions for the content of those posters or anything related to denial that might be kind of fun to put on the fairgrounds? I like what Savril wrote, that they like to see the monocle being put on and the whole screen like flips to reveal the alternate darker world. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, not a bad idea. So maybe that's, you know, it's something both on the poster and something that is acquired. Let's, let's see if that makes sense. Um, in terms of delivering that item to the player that early in the game, I'm not sure. But we'll take a look at the timeline and see if it makes sense. Uh, Connor asks, are you getting Roger L. Jackson in for the Cheshire Cat? It's a bit off topic, but yes, Connor, we've actually had roger on a live stream once and uh, he is fully committed to being the cheshire cat again and so yes and the same goes for susie we've talked to both her and roger um, quite a few of the people you know that were involved with the original alice game and the, and the sequel uh, will be returning um, so no worries there always love working with roger he brings a lot he's not just the cheshire cat i mean by the way i mean he's played uh, many, many of the voices in the Alice games. So it's it's not um, just the Cheshire Cat. We need him back for a lot of reasons. All right, let's see. Any other comments we have here? Uh, Nick's Bat suggests that there could be a poster of Alice looking at herself as an adult. Actually, that's a that's a kind of interesting one since these are denial related, um, there could be something of a hint of Shadow Alice or Adult Alice uh, on one of the posters. And Seafoam is talking about a mermaid who denial about her condition. Uh, she is a human who has been eaten by a fish and she holds her breath and pretends like she is a fish, maybe stuff like that. Okay. Um, Savril asks, did we see the Disney poster suggestion uh, fits right into Alice's world and that time frame? I'm not sure what that reference uh, is the to. Haunted the Haunted Mansion. The Haunted Mansion posters that stretch out when you're in the room that has no windows and has no doors. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, so the question was, have I been to Disney and have I seen those haunted house posters? Uh, I have been to Disney. I'm not sure I understand. Maybe I haven't been to the haunted house enough times to remember. It was like 20 it's years a, ago. So, uh, Yeah, it's in the room that stretches as Truth Decay says, and it's you, you're all herded in, and then it has the disembodied voice saying, you know, yada, yada, yada. Right. Uh, sure. <laughs> sure, yes. <laughs> J 
just looking through the comments here to see if there's anything else. Um, so Truth Decay asks, when will Susie be on the live stream? Um, so I can I can reach out to her. She generally tends to be kind of more accessed through her agent. And um, she tends to be, I guess you could say she's a bit more by the book. Um, so we, we can talk pretty easily. I can just email Roger directly and say, hey, do you want to come on to the live stream? He'll say yes. Uh, when it comes to Susie, there's a bit more involved in getting her involved. Um, and one of my concerns is like, if we were to set up a live stream and then it failed due to internet problems, um, that would be not great. Whereas with Roger, he'll just kind of laugh it off and not a big deal. So uh, let me let me look into that though. We, we've said before that we might explore the idea of live, uh, not live streams, but pre-recorded sessions, because that gives us a little more control over if the internet's going up and down, we can reset and continue and then piece everything together after the fact. So um, Martin and I are talking about that and we'll, um, we'll see if we can put something together. It would be good to okay. uh, talk with her because the Roger Jackson and the Chris Brenner streams, they were, they were huge fun. Yes, they were. All right. Um, okay, so I'm continuing through the chat and just trying to pick out if there's anybody else um, who's put something in here in terms of the content of these posters. And um, yeah, I think we're good here. Okay. Um, unless anybody else has something major to contribute to the poster concept, that's something that I think the group of you can work on um, as a crowd and you can put suggestions forth to Arcadia slash Taylor. Um, and then we'll filter those to the artists and we'll get a couple of these posters put together um, as concept art. So you can see your ideas brought to life. Um, so again, try to keep it on the, the topic of denial and of the kind of rides and the weirdness that you might see on the fairgrounds. And um, I did post into the chat here the image of um, the, the posters themselves. You can kind of see the format of them and how they'll wrap around the building. And uh, let's see what kind of fun stuff we can come up with. Um, I'm always impressed with the creativity of our insane children. So let's see what you guys can do on that one. All right, we are going to hop over to the wiki page for denial. Again, if you're following along on YouTube, um, there are links to the wiki in the description below. And to find denial, the section we're going to discuss right now, from the main page, just scroll down to the main heading for story, and then click on the subheading for denial. And that will bring up the page that contains what we've done so far in terms of the description of this realm and the things contained within. Um, so this is going to be modeled around a circus. Um, it is a sort of circus of the mind that's meant to keep Alice occupied and away from the traumatic events that have just preceded. That is her family dying in a fire and her being institutionalized in an asylum. So this place, um, we have at the top of the page who's contained within it. Um, there are a bunch of cosplaying characters. That is, there's a bunch of characters putting on an act of what we kind of in the past have come to understand to be Wonderland. Um, that is, there will be characters like the Caterpillar and the Cheshire Cat and the Mad Hatter, uh, the Duchess, but they're all, they're all just characters playing dress up because this whole realm is nothing but a big illusion. Um, again, it's just a kind of distraction away from her reality. And of course, uh, we will have along with us the rabbit companion. Um, that'll be Alice's little rabbit plush that she's carrying along in her hands. And we will meet Tweedledee and Tweedledum, the actual characters, because they are the ones who are putting on this act. They are, and I think the the sort of message there that they are dumb. They're not terribly bright. Um, so it would be their instinct to hide in an illusion. Um, now we've listed out here that we're gonna acquire certain weapons um, like stealth frogs and a time clock and perhaps a carousel. Um, 
there's a reference here to the outfits. So we do have a denial dress that she'll be wearing and a circus outfit. Now the circus outfit um, is fairly controversial because a lot of people did not like the circus outfit on Alice. Uh, but that is the point because what we've said is that Alice is forcibly conscripted into being a performer in the circus and she too does not like the circus outfit um, and she doesn't like being a part of the circus but that sort of comes on slowly it's a sort of slow realization that she's playing a part in something that is not healthy and um, we have here what the player learns uh, that is to use the time clock and um, collectible engine and then from here we're going to go um, <clears throat> We go from shock to denial, <clears throat> and then from denial, we're going to get into anger. So does anybody have any questions or comments or concerns about what is denial, what we're doing there, why we're there? The Octo Chicken says, should their costumes be as close as possible to the Tennille versions as they would potentially be what they looked like the last time she was in Wonderland? or would line up with her yellow dress denial, um, looking like the book dress? I think that's a fair question. Um, my initial thought would be it might, it might be quite a lot in terms of a disconnect for people who've never played the Alice games before to suddenly encounter those characters, and they're, they're maybe not going to get the dis, this sort of... Um, the statement we're trying to make. They might view those characters as be what the characters in Wonderland looks like, if that makes sense. Um, so I think that's an interesting suggestion. I, I'm just a little bit concerned about the confusion it might cause. But I think we could explore that, though. Yeah, I like having it where we're kind of working with the original illustrations and then just having that as a as a stopping point of here's what she remembers and is being cosplayed from these characters and isn't really what's there anyway so that's what works nicely with it that it's a cost but to some degree there's always been on my part a kind of forced rejection of the imagery that came from the books and obviously from any other source like say disney for instance you know that that being obvious because we don't want to get sued um but i kind of feel like our representation of these characters is the representation as far as our alice is concerned it's not like it's not like when she arrived in you know ama or when she first encounters the real hatter in this we're going to have her exclaim oh my god you look different you know what I'm saying? Yeah, point. So, I mean, if we dress them, up, we dress as the them up as the team. <laughs> uh, Martin, you might uh, want to mute your mic. Mute your mic. I'm sorry. It's having... So, if we dress them up as the Tennille characters, and then we, we, we're going to have to explain why they transform into the, the characters from our game later on. Okay, any other comments on that point or? So Ancient Child asks, has it been discussed the idea of connecting this to the action happening at the asylum? Um, I think we have talked about overlapping characters, themes, things like that between what's going on in Wonderland and what's going on in the asylum. But, you know, we haven't done anything by way of like sitting down and really sketching out what that looks like. Um, so if, you know, if you have ideas about the kind of crossover you'd like to see there, then sure, you know, bring that forward and we can talk about it. Uh, Connor says that he wants to say he loves the botanical garden area concept art. It reminds me of the solar punk aesthetic uh, I hope you aim for a solar punk vibe for it in the final. Um, I've never heard of solar punk before. Um, so I guess we'll have to look that up um, and see 
Solar Punk is a hopeful sci-fi future to believe in. I ancient, see. Ancient child would like to speak. Okay, go for it. Hello. 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 Okay, so um, one of my all-time favorite movies is um, Stonehurst Asylum, and that is based off of one of Edgar Allan Poe's stories of the same name, where the inmates run the asylum, and in the very first scene of it, it displays something that was done a lot, especially in Bedlam Psychiatric Hospital, where the inmates were displayed as um, freaks that people could pay to go see, as well as they're displayed for educational purposes to um, asylum students. Um, I forget the technical term for that, but anyways. Um, basically, they were the circus freaks that people could come see and gawk at. So I was thinking that there could be a very distinct correlation between that happening and then Alice turning into her denial of that happening as well as the inmates being part of the circus performers and um, showcasing various mental illnesses and possibly going back and forth between the asylum and a circus or just having like a shot of the asylum and then transitioning that strictly to the circus. Yeah, I think that that could work. Um, we could actually have a kind of freak show area within the circus. And then, like you said, that could blur the lines between the actual asylum and what's going on there and what she's envisioning as a part of the circus. So I think that's, um, that's something we can definitely look at. It's a good idea. And I'll go watch St Stonehurst Asylum. I, had, I wasn't aware that that was even a thing. Hmm. Um, but it looks like it was a Netflix. Is it a TV show or just a movie? It's a movie and it is on Netflix and it is so, so good. Okay. Well, I will go check that out. It looks um, like it's very much in our kind of realm and era. Um, so that's, that's good. I like that a lot. Hey, thank you so much. Cool. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. We'll have a look at that. And yeah, I think having the crossover um, back and forth between the asylum and whatever she's doing in Wonderland is something we want to play with quite a bit in um, in this one. Okay, so I think that um, I'm looking at more comments here. If anybody else wants to talk, if they have a microphone that's working. Um, so Connor Carbon had previously mentioned solar punk aesthetic. Um, I had a look at that, and yeah, I like this aesthetic a lot as well. Um, I think that within the scope of the greenhouse itself, you know, the concept of a green, greenhouse is that it is an artificially maintained environment, and so that fits within the realm of denial. Um, how far we push this, uh, you know, I think into the future, there will be a certain aspect of the what was it the Crystal Palace that was in the Victorian era and that was sort of meant to echo to the future? Um, that will definitely be something that we see here. I don't know how far into the future we're going to push this, but um, we'll definitely try to have the interior of that greenhouse to be something of a Jules Verne, you know, future glimpse type of place. Okay, just reading through the comments a little bit here. Uh, Jacob says, if we're making sure that Alice is shocked by the real character's appearance after the fire, their cir circus equivalent imposters shouldn't look like they do in the other games. I mentioned this because the Hatter imposter in the concept art looks a lot more like the Hatter in the AMA Hatter. Um, yeah, I don't know that she's meant to be shocked by the circus appearance imposters. I, I think early on she's supposed to be fooled by them. That is the whole point of the realm of denial is that she's living there quite comfortably. So when we first arrive in denial, it should be a comfortable place that she kind of thinks she might want to stay in forever because it helps her to avoid the reality, the horror of what's happened outside of denial. So I'm not sure, Jacob, if that comment um, goes in line with that or it's a sort of challenge to that. 
Um, I had thought, though, that at some point, if we could see these costumes come off of the circus characters, the ones that are the imposters, what we would see underneath are horribly burnt sort of bacon people who have been through the fire um, and that once their costumes come off, that's not a good thing. We don't really want to see that. Um, so that's something to think about. Uh, Arcadia has posted up a picture that does the actual mirroring of the Asylum characters to the Wonderland characters. Um, so this is certainly a topic we've talked about and looked at in the past and that we want to continue with Asylum. That is that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between certain real world, real world characters and the characters that Alice manifests in Asylum. They are great pictures as well. And, but we never did them as posters yet. Maybe we could look into that. Did you did you ever look into doing it as a lenticular image? I remember I you did. talking. Well, no, I don't remember if it was this particular print, but I did go to the print shop that we use, and they were not very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> they, Although they do lenticular printing, they didn't actually have any idea of how we would need to provide the images. It was a, it was a little bit of a dead end. <laughs> That particular print shop may not be the best solution for that. Um, we can yeah. look into it. it. It's just that, as I've said before, when it's just myself and Martin who have to sort of research and then implement, say something like those insane asylum, the, the, the insane tags that we did recently, um, it's a little bit of lifting for us to like, to find the factory and to make them do the right thing and then to get everything sent out. Um, so it's sort of like every couple months we can kind of handle one of those things and not really more often than that so we'll, we'll look into the lenticulars that needs to go back on our list of um of things to play with maybe we could do that as a reward yep sounds good uh so back to the comments um we have connor carbon has said yes plus in terms of gaming mechanics the starting area needs to be the least difficult and the most conducive to learning platforming and other mechanics in a relatively safe areas. That is true. Um, we will have come out of deny, uh, out of, sorry, shock, which is going to be a largely sort of uh, sneaking around stealthy kind of area into denial where there will be actual gameplay of platforming and engaging with enemies. Um, and so we're going to have to slowly ramp the player into that kind of gameplay. And um, yeah, that would be, I think, a good place to do that. Wendy says bacon people. Yes, well, they're, they are bacon wrapped in costumes. <laughs> uh, OK, just going through the comments again really quickly here. Uh, Jacob returns to his comment and says, I was saying that they the imposters dress up <clears throat> to look more like the original characters do in the books silly and whimsical and less like they end up looking in ama and amr like the hatter imposter should probably not be on stilts and have a semi-sinister hat but be dressed more dwarfish and frumpy and carrying around a buttered bread or some other such object uh okay <clears throat> i'm I think this is going back to the question of the representation of the actors on the stage. Um, so I, I think we can try to have a look at how they're dressed up. But again, um, I, I'm a little concerned if we move too far away from the style we've established already in the games, that it may cause some confusion um, for people, but more importantly, it may cause some requirement or effort on our part to explain the shift from whatever they, you know, if we did represent them differently um, as the actors, and then later on we have to shift to their representation in the game, um, it would be my concern that the player may not make the connection that one character is the other character uh, without, without exposition, without explanation, if that makes sense. But I may be misunderstanding uh, Jacob's comment here, so perhaps this is one um, that could get written up and sent separately or written as a comment on the wiki page, because um, that is something that the wiki page does allow is commenting. 
Okay, speaking of the wiki page, let's jump back there really quickly. Um, so there is a concept section. I don't know if anything in the concept is sort of controversial. Uh, we describe denial as the first stage of grief, but actually that's not right. This would be the second stage because the first stage is shock. Um, so we do want to fix up that reference. And um, I think that's because early on we thought about denial being the first area that we went into. And um, I think that's changed a little bit. We do, of course, talk about the rabbit plush as Alice's companion, um, the, the rabbit plush running ahead of Alice to guide the way, other times uh, jumping onto Alice's arms for a ride. So I think this portion, uh, this sentence, it contains a lot that we need to flesh out. That is the mechanic of the character of uh, the use of the rabbit plush, uh, because it's going to play a very important role it gives Alice her sounding board. She'll be able to talk to the rabbit at times when she's nervous or curious or confused. Um, and then, of course, he'll be able to pull her forward. Um, so you could think about, you know, the rabbit plush is sort of the, our equivalent of boy in God of War um, or Boozer in uh, Days Gone, which I'm playing now, um, but hopefully not, not as useless and retarded as boozer because he's he's quite quite the you alcoholic layabout <laughs> yeah if i could shoot boozer um and put him out of his misery <laughs> i would have done that a long time ago uh so it says here that the rabbit is alice's curiosity pr uh, projecting itself forward into the unknown that's a great expression for that and um yeah so she expresses her fear and wonderment um, to rabbit throughout the journey and I think that, um, you know, as we describe here, the Cheshire Cat appears from sort of a darker place within Alice's mind. I don't know that it's a darker place, but it's certainly uh, a more critical, more perhaps more rational place. Um, so there is a very distinct, though, this is important, there's a very distinct difference in the characters um, that are contained within those two entities, the rabbit and the Cheshire Cat. Uh, I do think we ought to spend quite a bit of time thinking about the mechanic of the rabbit because the rabbit is going to be more than just, you know, a, kind of a small character. It's, it's a very central character, um, and it's also a character that she has taken away from her uh, by the queen. So we need to build up the connection between Alice and the rabbit prior to that happening as well. Just going through the chat here, um, there's a lot of bacon going on now. <laughs> and um, so I think bacon people are a big hit. I guess bacon could be one of the advertisements on the posters. That would be cruel and vicious to have an advertisement for bacon. <laughs> Fa family, family flavored bacon. <laughs> family portion bacon. Exactly. Duchess brand uh, bacon, even though. Duchess awesome. brand family flavored bacon. There we go. Just uh, like terrible. You get at home. Uh, but that would make me laugh if I saw that as a poster in the game. So there you go. Uh, Connor Carbon says to Asteria is the audio page on the wiki in reference to Madness Returns or Asylum. I've been meaning to ask about uh, soundtrack plans for Asylum but it's too early to ask. Um, yeah, I mean, soundtrack, we're definitely going to have a soundtrack. We're going to have, I hope, Chris Verna come back. Uh, we also have another option opening up. Um, Martin and I have heard music from somebody who's actually created an entire vocal album that is actually very, very good. Um, and again, referring to Days Gone, there's a sequence in there. I don't know how many of you played this, but you're riding along on your motorcycle and a song comes on that kind of goes along with you as you take this ride through the landscape. And I thought that moment actually worked really, really well. And it's funny because right after I played that, uh, this album got sent to us and I thought, wow, we could actually have, and we've been talking about, you know, musical sequences in the game. Um, we could actually have songs like that as backup to moments of exploration um, inside of the game. So I, I think that as far as soundtrack goes, Connor, we're going to probably have multiple offerings um i'm a big fan of soundtracks i wouldn't mind if we had like the orchestral version and we had the in-game version and we had the vocal version and we had a couple different offerings there are we going to have the musical yeah, version yeah. Too? <laughs> and the musical version 
Yeah, as I say, I listened to that album a couple more times yesterday, and yeah, it's quite it grows on you, and you can yes. imagine playing the game, and you know, like some cutscenes happening and everything. It was quite evocative. I it's, quite liked it. It works really well. I don't know how much I'm supposed to give away right now, but I'll say that the artist um, did an album, and each track is in reference to one of the stages that we're talking about having be in the game. Um, so Denial, for instance, is a track, and um, it's, I think, very well done. Um, so I need to kind of work with that artist and uh, management to see how, when, where, how, why, um, what the format is of sharing that type of stuff and how we might integrate it with the project. But um, it was very impressive, actually. Well, it looks All right. like Alice on Elm Street wants to uh, lend their voice, if Yay. I'm not mistaken. Okay, let's do that. And there we are. Is it active? Now you are. Is it on? Yes. Um, oh, can you hear me? Sorry. <laughs> we can hear you. Okay, so everyone's talking about how, um, like, the actors, like, should they look like the characters from the first two games or should they look different? And so I kind of had a kind of a middle ground idea of they look like the characters from the other two games but they're getting like key things wrong about the characters like the mad hatter being obsessed with cake and alice is like that's supposed you're supposed to love tea what are you doing like this is wrong yeah i think i see your comment there um in the chat and i think that's actually a really good middle ground um well it's more than a good middle ground it's just a really good solution in general because it allows us to visually represent as the characters that we know um with the obvious sort of mistakes that they might make in their costuming, but it is the characters that we know that she knows, um, but having her recognize that there's something off about them that isn't about necessarily about their costumes, the visual appearance, that would be great. And it gives her and those characters and everyone else some room to have some dialogue. Um, and of course, for us as not just players of the game, but as Alice fans in general, to be like, oh yeah, the, the Mad Hatter is supposed to like tea. Why is he on about bacon? Um, and that'll mean that people who've never played the games before will get the reference. So that's one of the things I would worry about with the kind of mischaracterizing their costuming is that people who've never played the game before wouldn't get that. They, they wouldn't know, oh, look, the costumes are wrong. What you're suggesting works perfectly because people would know, oh, the Mad Hatter's not supposed to you know, be into tea or into cake, he's supposed to be into tea. So that's perfect. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, that works really, really well. And you always come up with very good ideas. I'm so glad to have you on board putting ideas forth because you, you have a knack for it, I want to say. Thank you so much. That means so much. Yeah, no worries. All right, what else have we got going on in the chat here? Um, Ancient Child would like to pop in for a sec. Let's go for it. So I wanted to um, further add on to Alice on Elm Street's idea with the her recognizing that the characters are doing things incorrectly being the segue out of denial for her and kind of shattering that illusion of denial because she just realizes, oh, wait, this isn't right. None of this is right. And like we start noticing like the exact seams ripping a part of the costumes of the imposters. And everything mm. just kind of shrivels down from there. Yeah, I think that works. Uh, it could be that it happens slowly, but as she continues to return back to wherever their stage is or wherever she encounters them, uh, that they initially, the illusion holds. But like you said, the more that she ends up challenging their mistakes, the more their costumes start to fall apart and the more we start to see um, the truth of the bacon people underneath. <laughs> I also see it as an interesting idea of kind of a collection mechanic too, where you find each character um, and try to figure out things, kind of a puzzle that would work well. Yeah, I think having her slowly realize that something's not right here, and like you said, collecting the evidence that something's off, because she is... Obviously, I mean, I think regardless of the trauma and of her 
in the the kind of incorrect instinct to to dive into denial she is curious um that's one of her personality traits that you know wouldn't go away and that her curiosity is not going to be denied and so it could be that the curiosity is what drives her towards unraveling those threads and then the costumes come off and so that would work quite well I had a thought just now of as she's realizing, as she's like going through in the beginning, the lighting's like really bright. So it's almost like everything's overexposed, kind of like a, a trickle down effect from shock. But as she starts seeing things going askew, the lighting gets dimmer until we're able to see the exact true nature of things. Yeah, that would be a good one um, because that's what we do when like say Martin and I don't want to show how truly old and wrinkled we are is we crank up the lighting in the studio and we crank up the fuzziness on the camera. Um, so then it takes like, you know, 15, 20 years off of our age. Uh, doing the same thing in this denial realm would make a lot of sense that she's got kind of a fuzzy camera filter and overexposed lighting going on um, early on that makes everything look, you know, circusy and happy and glittery and a, a bunch of star, the sort of starburst effects around all the bright lights. Um, but as that wears off, it starts to reveal that where she's walking around is in fact dirty and dingy and terrible. Um, so that, that would be a really cool transition to see as well. Okay, uh, well, let's, we'll make note of all those points. Those are some actually some very good points on how to deal with the presentation and then the transition um, within this realm. Jacob asks, how long is Alice going to have been in denial by the time she realizes she's lying to herself? Um, that's a tough question because we don't know sort of the, the time frame references between uh, reality and what's happening in Wonderland. You know, is it sort of inception like where when she's in Wonderland, time and reality is passing a lot slower? Um, you know, do we care how well locked up and synced up those clocks are? Um, so I guess the question is, does it matter? And, and which clock are you referring to? Um, as far as I understand it from our design notes so far, uh, denial is a, is a distinct stage. It's an area, it's a level within the game. And she will have been in denial for us as the player will be playing in that zone for, you know, probably an hour or more. Um, so is that the question you're asking? Of course, we could be playing for an hour or two in that stage, but the in-game time representation might be several cycles of sort of the sun. So for her in that place, it could be several days. Um, but for us as the player, it might only be a few hours. OK, so I'm just scrolling down through the comments here. Uh, there's a lot of bacon going on here. We love our bacon. We do like bacon. I think bacon is, um, is quite good. I always liked Homer Simpson's incredulous comment to Lisa that, come on, Lisa, that can't all be one super animal. God wouldn't have made a super animal like that. All those types of bacon, sausage, everything coming from one, one place. <laughs> uh, okay, so I've caught up on the comments. Back to the wiki page and just scrolling down through again in the concept here. We've already found a couple of points that we've explored and a couple of things we need to fix up. Um, we are looking at now Alice's goal inside of this realm. So what's been written here is a sort of rearranging of the deck chairs while the sink, while the ship sinks, or making the bed while the house burns. Uh, I think that a while ago we thought that the Jabberwock was going, the Jabberwock was going to be released from its cave and was going to blow up denial. But we now know that that's not the way this is going to come apart. Um, we're actually going to exit denial in effect by choice by transiting through the house of horrors um, so on the wiki we'll want to clean this up that no the jabberwocky is not 
the exit from denial. Um, so we'll fix that. Uh, onto the story, um, it says here that Alice arrives at the denial, the, the denial ray, realm, and it's a giant amusement park. Yes, we know that. Uh, and she's going to walk around and see all of this, that is the fairgrounds and everything. Um, so there's essentially like a, a village or a town that she can explore. Um, I think we're going to need to come up with a mission at, for this realm that involves her fighting, that involves her engaged in battle. Otherwise, there's not going to be a lot for us to do. Um, so one of the things I would put out there just as a, a starting place would be something along the lines of we arrive at the circus and the Tweedles inform us that the whole place is sort of under attack. Um, so it could be that there is something, essentially reality is trying to intrude upon the illusion. And so it could be that Alice needs to fight against the reality. Now, how or what form that reality takes, I don't know yet. I'm sure we can come up with some good ideas. Um, or we may come up with a different way of portraying this. But that would be my initial sense, is that denial is under attack by agents of reality. And that Alice is conscripted into uh, a number of missions. You know, it could be that she's got to go collect bits and pieces for the costumes or for the show. Um, it could be that she's got to go out and, I don't know, sell tickets <laughs> or something. Um, but the battle, the battle, the fighting portion of this, um, I'm thinking is going to have to be on behalf of the Tweedles and it's going to have to be on behalf of trying to continue to maintain the illusion or the, um, the state of denial. So I'm kind of curious what everyone thinks about that. Um, well, I thought one idea we had with going through was actually putting up posters, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. last time we talked to, uh, and that would be kind of maybe putting the posters up to try to hold back reality. Like, you know, you put them where rifts are, things like that. So mm. it's like kind of hide, you know, what's coming through. That's a good idea. So we would have sort of fissures, crevices, cracks in the illusion, and these posters are kind of like a, a virtual tape that she's using to cover over those things. And thinking about that further, maybe we take those posters away from the haunted house, put in them on the other place, so that's why that area opens up. Um, that might be taking it a bit far. Um, but we can definitely think about it. I mean, the idea that the posters are already surrounding the haunted house suggests that someone else already did their best to cover it up. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that taking our supply of posters down from there, because I mean, all that would happen is that the first poster you took down would reveal that there's something really crazy going on behind it, right? Um, I, I think that your idea that we're using the covers or posters to cover up things in denial makes a lot of sense. It makes sense then that the haunted house is completely wrapped in them. Um, but I, I think she's probably got another source for them. That the posters coming off the haunted house. Well, on this subject in the chat, I noticed Jacob says he'd like to share a quick idea. Sure. All right. All right, good to go, Jacob. Okay, uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yep. Great. Um, so uh, you, you kind of want like a something to fight against um, in the introduction for the circus, um, and I think that um, a good idea for having an, a sort of enemy that the circus would want to fight would be uh, maybe a form of medication. So uh, maybe one of the doctors in reality is actually. Um, got some kind of medication that might actually be able to help Alice or uh, what comes to mind, what came to mind originally was um, the quote from Dr. Bumby at the beginning of Madness Returns where he asked Alice to go get the medicine from the high street chemist. Um, so the enemies could be the ruin, uh, something that maybe looks like the ruin or something that's very clearly like um, medication like pills, uh, just something that might have like a chemical appearance. Um, that way, you know, the, the circus is fighting against something that's very sterile, orderly, um, or just very, like, 
has a harsh contrast, like the ruin being all black and goofy and the circus being colorful and confetti. Um, just something like that. Like maybe uh, somebody on the outside is treating Alice and this treatment is attacking the circus because the circus is an unhealthy um, method of her coping. Um, and then it, it, as far as that, I did have an idea that I posted in the, um, um, the armory and concepts that gave like an idea for the elements that we could use. And maybe like the first element that we could come in contact with would be like the confusion element or whatever. Um, and just like, that would be a tie-in for something like that. Right. Well, we know that as an external force acting to try to help push Alice through that, um, this, all of this, we have the, the shadow Alice representation. Um, so it might make sense that it's shadow Alice who's helping to try to destroy this illusion, um, which could also early on help to set up the idea that shadow Alice is a foe, um, that she's not, you know, she's not on our side, even though later on we might figure out that a lot of her actions are in fact for our benefit and for our progress. Um, so having her sort of bring shadow and bring, you know, a, an end to the illusion here could make a lot of sense. Yeah, or she could be leading the army of whatever's attacking or something like that. Yeah, I see like Seafoam says here that Shadow Alice is leading an army of corpses. Um, you know, that would be pretty awful. I, I actually like that, that like it's it's the burnt, you know, people reality that's trying to invade into this um, this circus and um, that it's Shadow Alice who's sort of controlling or leading them. Um, but I think, you know, we've got a little bit of space and time to explore. So I think, you know, let's, let's keep this topic open because it's a pretty critical one and it's a, it's a pretty big one. So, you know, what is it that we're fighting against here? What is it that's trying to knock down the illusion of denial? Um, I do want to ask a question here. We have one comment. Nabi Yang, she says, please, no quest hubs, no filler quests that are popular these days. And I'm kind of curious to hear what that's in reference to. Is that in reference to the idea that we are arriving here and then being asked to fight against the destruction of the illusion? Um, what qualifies as a quest hub, I guess? I um, think maybe... they were referencing the putting the posters up sounds like from where she was or he was or they were misgendering <laughs> that that comment came up at i see uh yeah i mean it's gonna be that's a good question as to you know an octo chicken greg says how linear versus section is supposed to be uh could determine the mission structure so i've said before that i envision the levels taking on um two kind of distinct forms. One is going to be more open, um, open area exploration-y kind of running around and returning to the same zones. Um, and then others are going to be more like puzzle boxes um, that might be like, you could imagine as the interior of a maze or a castle, um, interior of kind of like defined structures. This area, the, the circus realm is going to be first off a very, somewhat a larger kind of exterior explorable and you could return or kind of come back and forth across different areas of it multiple times. So imagine like a village, right? But within the village, they're going to be larger structures that can be more like a puzzle type room. Um, so imagine that the, the botanical garden building would be one of those, like you enter the door and then in order to exit again, you've got to complete whatever it is that's inside. Um, so it's going to be a, a bit of a mix. Uh, now, I think that's going to be the next thing that we start to work on here in terms of defining uh, the actual gating, the flow, you know, where do you enter, what do you do, and then, um, you know, how do you ultimately exit this, this area? Uh, it looks like Connor we've got to speak Connor well. with his sultry voice would like to... <laughs> jump in there <laughs> there you go all right connor we're waiting oh yeah uh, <laughs> i was switching my headphones 
Is my mic level okay? I have to set it pretty much every time I jump on. Turn it up just a little more. Okay, it's turning up. Just don't crank up the sexy too high again. Just <laughs> not <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, oh, okay. So this is, so I'm kind of getting in a habit of just saying that things part, that are part of this game are reminding me of cool things and then telling you to hope that you take inspiration for them. So it, to continue that trend, because let's face it, everyone else tonight has already had amazing points. So I'm not too worried about adding too much of substance, but I wanted to share with anyone who hasn't seen it. This film from 2005, Mirror Mask. Oh dear! Um, and here's just a quick oh, Mirror Mask. Yeah, and, and and a lot of the people here might already know about it. Um, but yeah, when when we've been talking about kind of this, I mean, every one of these discussions, Shadow Alice seems to be a very integral part of this title. Um, and so this film, without spoiling stuff, is kind of like about a, a young adult girl, um, kind of the goes into a fantasy world story. And this film is pretty weird. It's kind of like a Neil Gaiman, Dave McKean mashup that they worked on. Um, but anyway, so she is a doodler, a drawer, <laughs> um, and having kind of tough family issues in real life. And so then she ends up kind of going into her own drawings or like into her own paper. She has um, drawings hung up all over a wall and that turns into this bizarre kind of other world. But the point is, everything kind of deals with the light dark duality um and there's kind of like a dark version of herself very similar to Coraline, um being a game and work uh and yeah so i just wanted to add just for inspiration's sake i mean i don't have any direct point to make but um whoever hasn't gotten bored enough to watch this pretty lengthy bizarre movie uh should probably check it out that's pretty much all i want to say yeah i remember watching this uh way back when and I thought at the time that it was super interesting and freaky. And um, yeah, it's definitely good fun to watch for reference. I think we may have even watched this at the Spicy Horse office when we were working on Madness Returns, if I remember correctly. So it, it's definitely come up before in reference to stuff and to the project. Okay, cool. I'm going to hop off the mic. Um, my other comment is a joke, but... When I was saying the OST stuff earlier, I was thinking you should get uh, Danny Elfman. Uh, if we had a million dollar <laughs> budget, I don't know if you know, but I think Elfman is one of those guys that says, don't call him uh, unless you have um, a million dollars. Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah I, I'm pretty sure that's where his, where his thing starts. Um, I always maintain that he's like the element the one out the ost of the uh alice Alice in wonderland right. the first film is like the only redeeming quality of that one so. yeah i the other problem is i would hate to work um having him involved would just further this whole like uh the fact that somehow the alice game series is ripping off on tim burton um so <laughs> okay uh, yeah very true right yeah now. Well, we've got our own. We've got our own great guy, um, which is Chris, and of course, there's a bunch of other musicians and and uh, vocalists we we can and have worked with. So, uh, I like Elfman's stuff a lot, but um, yeah, we'll we'll stick with our guys. <laughs> I love the comment, prima donna Elfman. So true. Yeah, I want to see prima donna Elfman go to Forbidden Zone. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, uh, Octave Chicken mentions Marshall uh, Crutcher. That's the guy who did the all the the cello composition um, for Madness Returns, and he did a phenomenal job. I'd really like to go back and work with him. Um, and of course, we'll have uh, Verna involved. That's why I'm saying that we could end up with a series of soundtracks, one being the orchestral, like say stuff from Marshall, and then something that's um, you know from Verna. And then also, as I said, we've got now these vocal tracks that have come in. So I imagine that we could actually end up with quite a large range of music, which is great. That's uh, Really oh good. my god before i go i have something of substance to actually add um do you think any of the elements of sound design um or the soundtrack um for asylum could fluctuate based on the zone like denial say it's really innocent and childlike um kind of boopy boppy music and then maybe it's really dark and symphonic or something um when shadow alice shows up or in the other realms or in the horror house or so on so yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, 
Are you talking about like dynamic music or like uh, certain um, instruments would come in as something happens and then they, they fade away as other things happen, but then to kind of like match the tone, like you're just walking and you have maybe flutes and a violin and then something really um, like combat starts to come up and then you, you hear like a deep cello or something like that kind mm-hmm. of add in. Well, well, definitely that, but uh, that could also, I guess it's kind of branching into two topics and that's something like a sound designer would think of in wise like like you know how do i make dynamic yeah uh, th- there's a i'm um, just wondering just about the soundtrack in general like i'm thinking of this is really obtuse to reference this but sonic cd um <laughs> how if you went if you changed the future of a given level there was a matching kind of bright happy version of the song that would play on the level or if you didn't it would be a dark dystopian robotic version of the song so i was thinking wow what if there was like thematic you know uh, motifs in the soundtrack like the music uh, yeah there, there's actually a really good example of something kind of like that that you're talking about um there's a fan project based on uh half-life 3 which apparently is never going to get made officially but um <laughs> so there's these fans that are making um this sort of demo right now and they've got this music score that plays different um sort of instruments based on what you've done in the level and then what's going on and it, they've done a really good job of matching it. So it's, I'll, I'll look it up here in a minute and then show it. But um, it's a really good example of like a sort of dynamic feel that you're like probably, I think what you're talking about, like yeah, music yeah. that responds to the events. Yeah. And it could be that or just as a basis. I mean, it doesn't have to be necessarily dynamic, like uh, real time, but that would be a fantastic, fantastic addition. I'm a huge fan of anything sound design. Um, I noticed in the wiki, the, sorry, the wiki article from their, their notes uh, from Madness Returns were, was, had a lot of really deep concepts. Like uh, I think they mentioned ambisonics or or uh, binaural audio um, with some of the horror elements. So just anything like that, because I think a lot of um, de- a lot of games leave out how important sound design is, and will just do kind of just enough to get by. But I think a game like this can really afford. Be based on the psychedelia aesthetic, basically, um, you have a lot of room to experiment with things moving around in people's headphones. Like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wearing 5.1 surround gaming headphone right now. So, I mean, you could put weird stuff all over the place. And, and like you said, the dynamic um, changing. And yeah, I think it would be cool to um, hear music and maybe even sound effects change with the mental states of Alice throughout the game. If if that wasn't seen as by American and the team as maybe too much, which could be the case. So it's, um, it's something you touched on. It, it requires an early awareness of and planning for and a budget for, to be honest, um, the concept of, hey, we're going to have dynamic music and it'll work like this, this, and this. And it means having to hire a team or, or some individual who has that goal in mind from the beginning of the project. So what I would suggest is that we make a point to outline what's desired in the wiki now. And that way, when it comes time to put together the team, and that is you know put together the budget, um, that work is already in there. Because we can't do it after the fact. And that's what oftentimes happens, is if someone doesn't bring it up early on, it doesn't make it into the planning, then it just doesn't happen. Excellent. Thanks so much for your input on that. I do hope that some type of shifting uh, sonic qualities end up in the final game. I'll be a huge fan of that. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I'm a very big fan of having proper music in the games. Um, and I think it's a really critical portion of it. It just it can get left aside because uh, there's, there's so many other things that, that end up sucking up the focus. Um, Getting back to the chat really quick, there was one that scrolled by here from Nabby. Um, they say that there should be a fortune teller at the fair, and I think that's a really good idea. And then Magus jumped onto that and said that could be using the tarot cards. Um, so yeah, this is a fantastic combination of ideas here. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. It fits together with some of the themes and the concepts we've had before. So um, we will have to make sure that something like that makes it in there. Um, we had a question, somebody said, uh, this is Siren Shadows, said uh, that they are a musician and would like to start voice acting 
would there be any chance I could do that with this? Um, I'm thinking that this is a request if the person can engage with voice acting in the project. Um, we get this question about, hey, I'm a voice actor, can I work on your stuff? Probably more often than just about any other question. So like if we had a dollar for we got this question, we'd have enough money to fund um, several <laughs> games. Um, so that is to say there's a lot of competition out there in this area. Uh, I'd like to mention, you know, that the person um, I, I brought up earlier that sent in an entire album, that was not by request. That person clearly wants to be involved with music on the project to the extent that they went into the studio, they went and found, they, I mean, the, the level of quality is stunning, um, and they've sent that in, and that's definitely a foot in the door. Um, so if you ask me the question of like, how do I get my foot in the door? That's sort of the level of commitment you have to make in order to get a foot in the door um, in this or frankly in most industries. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, what else have we got here? Just going through the comments. I do think that we should start wrapping up pretty soon here. Uh, we've got through quite a lot. And as you all know, I don't like to go all the way to the bottom of the well. Um, when, when we have material left, it's actually good to save that until the next session. And look, Luca has to go to bed now anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, we, we have to just work around their schedule. There you go. Uh, Connor says he wants to do voiceover narration for a character in the Out of the Woods audiobook. That would work. Um, see, Connor has already done his uh, auditioning. So yeah, more, definitely there's a spot for you there, Connor. Okay, uh, so let's start working on wrapping this up. It's been a good session today. Does anybody have any last or final super important questions, comments, or other things that we want to get to? Uh, I'll just throw in really quickly here. I think we actually have quite a bit of editing do on the denial page because I have found there's quite a bit of information there that is out of date. So maybe I can speak with Taylor and some of the other wiki editing people later on and we can just kind of go through markup and make some notes on what needs to change in here. Um, but I think it's actually been really useful to go through these paragraphs because obviously we've had a lot of creative um, ideas flow out of just that review. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, Ancient Child says, on the topic of duality, installing sacred geometry, alchemical symbols, architect, uh, archetypes, and whatnot into this. Um, Ancient Child, there will be a lot of work in layering that stuff in there. Um, usually I'm doing that sort of coincidental with the writing, like the dialogue and things like that. So um, there's already been some of it done for, say, the alchemical symbols as it relates to the levels that we're traveling through. Um, all the levels are already linked up with alchemy, and then there'll be more of that done um, as we put more flesh onto the skeleton, more bacon on the bones mm. of uh, the thing that we're building here. Okay. Um, Wendy says, if we need a woman that says, man, I'm your gal. All right. That's good to know, Wendy. Um, Anybody else got any last minute comments or questions here? I think we're good. Okay. All right. Well, this has been crowd design session number 14 for Alice Asylum. Links to the wiki and to our Patreon are in the description below. If you have been listening on YouTube and you would like to follow along and join in live next time, please do consider becoming a patron. Uh, among all the other perks that you get over on Patreon, one of them is access to our super secret, super insane Discord server. And via Discord, you can, in fact, interact with us in real time in chat and with your voice um, while we do these design sessions. Um, this is America McGee, and we do these sessions here with our insane children, uh, usually about once a week. So hopefully we will be back again next week. Um, do consider joining us. And again, links to the descriptions for all the things, links to the things that we do um, are down in the descriptions below. Anybody have any last minute 
voice madness they want to throw in. Like, share, subscribe, hit the bacon. Jib it up. Jib it up. All right, everybody. That's it. Farewell, bacon people. We will uh, fry you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> See you later. Bye-bye. Eat plenty of bacon. <laughs>